Well, amen. Let's pray together. Father, it is evident to us that the glory belongs to you. For those of us who have been reconciled to you through your son Jesus, our Savior, it is good to pause and remember and reflect the overwhelming mercy and grace and love that we have experienced and the new life that we live in Christ. Lord, as we open up the pages of your truth, your word, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us. That we would once again be clear about the calling upon our lives. That we would once again be restored in our confidence of how we are to live. Speak, Lord God. Your church is listening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Man, it's so good to be with you this morning as we kick off our back to school series called Why You Love It Here. Now, I've been pastor here for 25 years almost, and I love you guys. And it fires me up when I see the physical presence of our body manifest. So a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, um, we were hosting the, the Leadership Summit. And like we do every year for the past 15 years, you guys show up in your lime green shirts that says, I serve. All right? And one of the things that I love about it is that my friends, my fellow pastors, they come up to me and it's like, man, your people are amazing. And I'm like, yep, they are. They're amazing. Over 100 volunteers, two days, taking vacation time off work to come up here and serve other pastors in our city. It's this physical uh, representation of who we are. One of the other things I loved is uh, this January when we as a church, like 400 and something of us, went down to the Martin Luther King uh, March. And we as a church showed up in our red t-shirts and there was this block of red marching down MLK. And it was a physical representation that we believe that Jesus Christ reconciles. That he creates unity. And so we did something tough. We took time off our schedules. We drove downtown. We got out in the cold. And we did what was uncomfortable so that we could express Jesus in the world. What I want to talk to you about this morning is when it comes to why you love it here, one of the things that you love about Grace Point is that we are physically tenacious. So as we talk about this, I want you to understand it's based in an understanding of Scripture. So, for instance, Josh just finished an awesome series on the churches of Revelation. And every one of those churches is different, right? There's one church, but there's many churches. There's one universal church that we are part of when we proclaim Jesus as our Savior and receive the Holy Spirit. But we are all, we are all members of that church but those churches meet in many different locations. So for instance, um, I have some friends and they're identical twins. So their DNA is exactly the same, but their personalities couldn't be more different. Have you ever had that happen? Like you know people and they're, and they're twins and yet they're radically different? That's kind of the way churches are. So we're twins, we're all part of the body of Christ and yet we exhibit our own unique personality. And so at Grace Point, we have a unique personality. We found out more about this after the fire. Some of you who don't know, this uh, building that you are sitting in two years ago was a burnt out shell. And um, we had to rebuild. And as we were rebuilding, these design architects came in and they said, well, you have this chance to rebuild. And so we want the physical space to look and represent who you are as a church. And we're like, Okay, whatever, that sounds fine. Um, and so they sit down with us and they interview us for like a day. And then they go and they do their work and they come back the next day and they said, after sitting with you and hearing your story and doing research and talking to people in your church, um, talking to the staff, talking to the members, what we found out is that you guys are physically tenacious, you guys are emotionally raw, I don't know where they got that from, <laughs> you guys are intellectually accessible, you guys are socially purposeful, and you guys are spiritually redemptive. 
And as I look at script, Scripture and I see these characteristics embodied in Scripture, I thought, how fun would it be to do kind of like, uh, like the letter Jesus wrote through John to the Galatian church, or Ephesian church, or church at Thyatira. How cool would it be just to, to, to hear from God about the characteristics of our church? And so we start today with physically tenacious, and physically tenacious, and as we do, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 20. Now, in the chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is talking about his apostleship, what it, what it means to be an apostle. Now, apostle in the Greek means sent one. And in, in, in respect, um, all of us are sent ones, right? Because the the Great Commission says, go, make disciples. So God has called all of us to be sent ones, to represent him to the world. So Paul's talking about the characteristics, um, attributes of a sent one. And then he says in verse 19, though I am free to belong, uh, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. I'm free, you know, we, as Americans, we understand this. We have rights. So we're big on those, right? I'm free. But then he says, but I've made myself a slave to everyone. For what purpose? To win as many as possible. And then he basically says, to Jewish people, I become Jewish. To Gentiles, I become Gentile. To weak people, I become weak. To the strong people, I become strong. Meaning, I do what I got to do to make the gospel known. And he says, he says this, uh, in 23, Mark, it's still, I still fight in this ring up here. So if you could help me out a little bit. Anybody else hear that besides me? Okay, you do? Good. All right, so sometimes it could be just the ringing in my ears. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so what he says is this, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel. What I do, I do for the sake of the gospel. Then he says in verse 24, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Then Paul says this, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body, and I make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The first thing I want you to see is there is a correlation between physical discipline and spiritual health. There's a correlation between physical discipline and spiritual health. For instance, there's um, the spiritual disciplines. Jesus fasted. That is a physical discipline that manifests spiritual dynamics. He went alone early in the morning, got up while he was still sleepy, went out and prayed. That is a physical discipline that manifests spiritual benefits, studying Scripture, memorizing Scripture, gathering together in community groups. These are physical disciplines that take some physicality. We have to move and do that manifest spiritual benefits. And what Scripture says is that we do this we discipline ourselves physically so that we can manifest spiritual benefits so that we can express the glory of God. We don't do this so that we can get God's pleasure or get more saved, right? We do this so that we can manifest the glory of Christ Jesus to the world. So there's, there's these different gospels out there. Um, there is the gospel, all right? So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are known as the gospel, all right? We call them the gospels, plural, but there's only one gospel. It's just told in different stories, all right? And the gospel is the good news, and the good news is that Jesus has come to restore what was broken in the garden 
He has come to restore the promises to Israel. He has come to usher in the kingdom. And he says, here I am. My kingdom has come. He's come to do that. And the way that he does that, the way that he does that, so that's the good news. I'm here. My kingdom is at hand. That's the gospel. My life is the gospel. The way that he does that is he dies on the cross to remove the penalty of sin. Then God raises him up from the dead to display his power over death and that whoever follows him, follows him into his death and into his resurrection and the life that he lived, we can now live by faith. That's the good news. Some people heard a story that went like this. If you pray this prayer, you will go to heaven. That's good news, but that is not the good news. The good news is if you place your faith in Jesus, it is no longer you who live, but now Christ who lives in you. You receive the Holy Spirit, not so that you can have your passport stamped for heaven, and Jesus is like, good, you're in, okay, see you then. No. The good news is that you can now live resurrection life. Come follow me. And so that's why the gospel, the story of Jesus' life, is the gospel. And so those of us who've said we receive Jesus' life, we are now followers of Jesus, our lives should look a little bit like his. Meaning we don't just get our passport stamped, and come to church once a week. Meaning that the characteristics and the attributes and the lifestyle of Jesus would begin to be lived out. But you can't just do that, like, overnight. You have to say no to some stuff and yes to others. We are training for something, every one of us. And Paul says, I train for the gospel. I beat myself up so that my life follows the pattern and life of Jesus. We're all training for something. Some of you are training for a divorce. Some of you are training for addiction. Some of you are training for debt. We're all training for something. And Paul says, you don't just wake up one day as this passionate follower of Jesus. There's a lifestyle. Jesus got up early in the morning. Jesus fasted. Jesus prayed. Jesus proclaimed. Jesus walked miles and miles and miles to make sure the good news is known. And the, one of the things I love about Grace Point is we are physically tenacious and we live out and emulate the characteristic of Christ who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. He was tough, y'all. considered it joy, endured the cross, and he asked us to do hard things. He asked us to commit, to give, to serve, to go. You're training for something. Hey, you, were y'all here, anybody here uh, a few months ago when the sound went out? Yeah? It was one of those weird Sundays, you know, the guys are playing, it's about the second song. So we normally do four or five songs. It's about the second song and just boom, nothing. And we couldn't figure it out. Third song, fourth song, then it's time for me to get up to preach. And it's time for me to preach, and there's no, there's no microphone.
And aren't you glad that we have a sound system? I know I am. Howard Hendricks, one of my professors, he used to call us into his office, and you'd have to sit across his desk, and he'd go. He'd pick up a stapler. And he goes, what is this? And you go, it's a stapler. He said, no, it's a sermon illustration. And you need to use it as a sermon illustration before you leave my office. And so we'd sit there and we'd be like, oh. you know, you're on the spot and you've got to come up with a sermon illustration. And he's holding a stapler and you're like, he holds all things together? <laughs> he's like, good, that's it. But what he was trying to teach us is that life, everything has application. You see the life through a prism. And so you're, I'm telling you stories all the time of what happened to me this week. Because life is a sermon illustration. Why? Because I've been training myself since Howard Hendricks' office to see life that way. And so we're all training for something, but some of us have not trained for the gospel. We've not trained to be followers of Christ. We've had our ticket stamped, and then we come to church once a week to get our tank topped off, and that's about it. And the truth is, we, 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 we tell ourselves we're too busy, that we don't have time. You're training for something. There's a correlation between physical discipline and spiritual health. And if you're not experiencing spiritual health, very likely you haven't committed to follow Christ, not just mentally, I follow you, I want to be a Christian. But okay, so now I want to be a Christian, so now it's time to follow him. Second thing Paul says is this, you've got to focus your fight. He says, therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. You know, you're driving to church this morning, how many of you guys saw someone running? Anybody? Yeah. They were running, they weren't just going, you know, they, they were running. They had a purpose to their run. He says, I don't run aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer just shadow boxing or beating the air. Aimless Christianity. Aimless Christianity confesses Jesus as Savior so that you get your ticket stamped and you can be sure that you're going to heaven. And then... It says, now that I know that I get to go to heaven, I'm going to live life my way on my terms and use Christianity as a way to validate or get good things. Aimless Christianity is preventative. I don't want to go to the bad place. And so I'll say the prayer. And what Paul says is, no, we run with purpose. We don't get in the ring and just shadow box. We get in the ring with an opponent, and we study that opponent, and we know that opponent, and we fight, real fight. We're getting ready to have uh, the most incredible distraction that happens in our country every year, and it's called football season, <laughs> where Athletes who since five or six have been training very specifically and ruthlessly with unbelievable devotion and effort. And they discipline their bodies to take the skin of a pig and get it across a line on some grass. Or they're trying to prevent the other person with the pig from crossing the line. It's either one of those, okay? And so since the age of five or six, we've spent millions of dollars and hours of training so that they, with their physique and skill and speed and power, can take the pig ball and get it across the chalk line on the grass. And we're mesmerized by this. We spend millions, if not billions of dollars and we sit in front of our televisions, and we're just like, wow, look at the skill with which he got the pig ball over the chalk line. Wow. But in doing so, what we're celebrating is their physical discipline and commitment, which causes them to receive glory for how skillful they do it. 
And yet God has called us to something far more purposeful. He says, so discipline yourselves to follow me. I will give you my Holy Spirit, and I will empower you and enable you to do it, but you've got to get up off your couch and quit watching the pig ball and the chalk line and telling me that you don't have enough time to be in a life group. You don't have enough time to go on local mission. You don't have enough time to go across the world to share the good news with those who have never heard. You don't have enough time to commit to a financial peace university so that you can get out of debt, which you've been training to get into. You don't have enough time to work on your marriage. You don't have enough time because you're watching other people who have physically disciplined themselves since they were six to become world-class pig ball line crossers. And Jesus says, that's not the life. You want to come follow me and take up your cross daily. Third thing, I say it this way, Paul says it differently, suck it up. Paul says it this way. He says, no, I strike a blow to my body. I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul says, I beat myself. I bring myself into submission. Here's the thing. We have to fight entropy at every turn. My belly button used to be up here. <laughs> Stuff happens. Gravity, life is hard. It's not easy. And it's not going to get easier by coming home and going, oh, what a day I had. I think I'm going to grab some haagen and watch four hours of Netflix. <laughs> because I don't have time to pursue other things. No, anything in life we want to pursue it takes some effort. And so you have to fight entropy. And what Paul says is, I bring my body into submission. I wake up early and I get on my knees and pray and I study God's word. And on a night where I'd rather be at home with a haagen and Netflix, I travel across town to a life group to live together with others in community. And on my vacation, I come up and I, I serve at Leadership Summit. On my vacation, I fly over to Johannesburg and go on a mission trip. And I take my resources, and though I wish to buy this or I wanted to buy that, I recognize that God would have me to do this. And so I discipline myself to participate in his kingdom because that will bring glory to him rather than what will make me feel good. Because oftentimes the stuff that makes us feel good doesn't benefit us or anybody else. So Paul says, the flesh is weak and it wants to be pampered, so bring it into subjection. Some of you have a spouse like me who makes you better than you are. And so, you know, a typical weekend, oh yeah, and tonight we have the um, such and such dinner party. And I'll be like, ah, really? Yeah, baby, it's been on the calendar for months and, and it's tonight. Ah, let's not go. I really, I'm, I just... I, no, we're going to go. You know you want to go. I really don't want to go. It's at 7. You going to be ready? All right, I'll go. And I'm driving there, and I'm grunting. And I get there, and I have a good time. And I get there, and I'm like, oh, that was meaningful. Oh, that was significant. And then we're driving home, and I'm like, that was awesome. Thanks for... That's life. That's Sunday morning church. That's life group leader meetings. That's uh, being in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a community group. That's going on a local mission trip. That's uh, re stewarding your resources well. That's participating and serving in some way, shape, or form. That's called the body of Christ. I, I, I saw a video of LeBron James, and he was talking to his son's basketball team. And he's kind of getting on him. He's like, know your role. You got to play your role. If you want to be in an individual sport, you should do golf or tennis. This is a team sport. 
If you want to be in a, in a solo religion, try Buddhism. This is a team sport, y'all. It's called the body of Christ. I'm joking. Don't try Buddhism. But you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Pastor Jeff said to try it, so I know you guys. But what I'm saying is to follow Christ, he lived together with, tw- with, with 12 others. It wasn't a solo deal. And is it fun or easy? No, being in a life group is a pain in the rear. You got to care about people. Oh, man. They have needs. I'm telling you. And they say stuff that is dumb sometimes. Hello. It's called community. It's called the body of Christ. And it causes you to grow. So, Paul says, I beat myself up so that I can run this race called the life of Christ so that I can receive the prize. Every one of us has a next step in front of us. Dwayne Severson, I don't know if he's in this. He, he's, he's been here since day one. D- Dwayne Severson recently had knee replacement surgery. His wife's getting up in years. He's getting up in years. He's caring for her. He's got knee replacement surgery. And he, he's normally a, a, an usher but because he can't stand on his knee for very long, ushering is no longer his thing. So last week he asked, can I sit in the baby room in a rocker and have someone bring me a rocker, a, a baby to rock? That's physically tenacious. He's not in an RV spending his time doing whatever. Rocking a baby is not beneath him, though he had military-grade clearance when he was working in the data world. He's physically tenacious, and he shows up with one leg, and he says, I'll do whatever needs to be done. Hand me a baby so that somebody can go hear the gospel. That's what I love about Grace Point. You roll up your sleeves. You wipe the sweat off your brow. Jamie flew in the day of the fire. She came from the Holy Lands. She had a vacation to the Holy Lands. To this day, Jamie and I have never had a conversation about how her trip was. Because when she touched down, she came straight over here and spent two years sitting out at that concrete table making sure this place was rebuilt. Physically tenacious. And I love you guys. You put on your green shirt, you put on your red shirt, you roll up your sleeves. But that's who we are. And we've had a lot of change in the last couple of years. And you might be new But the reason that you love it here is because we will do what it takes and suck it up so that Jesus will be glorified. We will say no to ourselves and yes to him and do what is necessary even though it might be difficult on us. That's just who we are. And so if you didn't know that, welcome to Grace Point. If that scares you, awesome. It's called following Jesus and it's, it's amazing but it's not easy. He's got a next step for you. We call it grace, growth, gifts, give and go. He's got a next step for you. Maybe you're here today and you never understood that the gospel message is about giving your life to Jesus. The reason we say exchange my life is because we want people to understand the words invite him into my heart, pray the prayer so that I can go to heaven. That can be a little deceiving What we want you to know is, no, you're exchanging your life for his life. It is no longer you who live. It is now Jesus Christ living in you. And the life that you now live, you live by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so because you live that way, you should look different over time. Your life should manifest attributes and characteristics and lifestyles of Jesus So if it was just say the magic prayer and come to church every other weekend or so so that you can give them a high five when you get to heaven, that wasn't the good news. The good news is that you can live a transformed life now, but after you receive the Holy Spirit, then you have to walk it out. And that takes denying yourself and taking up your cross and following him. And so in the back of your chair is a next step card. It's just a simple way 
for you to say, here's my next step. My next step is to get baptized. My next step is to get in a life group. My next step is to go on foreign mission. My next step uh, is to exchange my life. My next step, what's your next step? What is Jesus calling you to? My parents are 80 and 83. My 83-year-old dad preaches every other weekend. My 80-year-old mom teaches um, at the Women's Job Corps every other week. They didn't retire from following Jesus. And some of y'all, you're like, oh yeah, life group, been there, done that. Have you? Have you been there, done that? You clepped out of, of community, did you? Wow. How impressive that is. I don't really go on global missions. I don't travel much. Um, after all, the world is right here. And that's true. What are you doing for right here then? The Syrian refugees, you want to see them? The Bhutanese, right over here, a mile, a mile from here? You actively pursuing them, or are you just coming up with excuse of why you can't? It's football season. We love watching people who have physically trained themselves to do amazing things, taking a pig across a chalk line. And Jesus says, physically train yourselves. I've given you the spirit. Now, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. If you're going to fish, you've got to put some bait in the water. And if you want to follow Jesus, it's time for you to take the next step. Let's pray. Father, as we close today, we're reminded of your grace and goodness to us. That your grace has covered it all and made it easy. And yet, after we receive your grace, the challenge is to, by the power that you've placed in us, follow you. Not by our own effort, not by our own strength, but by learning to listen and learning to follow you. I pray that someone doesn't hear works. I pray that what they hear is grace and spirit-filled determination to follow the glorious new life that is now in us. So Lord Jesus, you make your word plain and you challenge people in their seats today of their next step in pursuing you. May you receive the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to cover, uh, you know, emotionally raw, <laughs> intellectually accessible. One week is uh, socially purposeful. And so I want you to think about these next few weeks. Who would you invite? Who would you speak a word to? Socially purposeful is the people and relationships in our life are impacted and affected by our walk with Jesus. And that, on that week, I'm going to have you put something on your social media page. Some people are going to say, hey, come to my baptisms. It's, it's the following weekend. Um, and they're going to invite their friends. But I want you to think about being socially purposeful now so that when we get to that week, it'll have impact on the relationships around you. Great to see you this morning. Have awesome time fighting the traffic in the morning. And I'll see you next weekend. You're dismissed. <laughs>